Ah, there we go. Thanks. <coughs> so, as Rita said, I will give um, uh, an overview of um, open access publishing just to set the scene a little bit and then tell you something about um, our journal portfolio at Biomed Central, primarily to show you perhaps that um, uh, open access journals are in many ways very similar to traditional um, journals. And then in the second part of my talk, I will talk specifically about what it says here in, in, uh, in my title about the new peer review models that we and others have um, uh, been experimenting with and the experience we've had with this. So I'm sure that um, everybody will agree that um, access to knowledge has been changing and the way we access knowledge has been changing dramatically over the last um, decade or two. This is an image of um, some of our authors as they're doing their field work in, in Africa and are accessing information there and then on their laptops. And um, uh, I'm sure that's true for all journals, open access or not, people go online to, to find out about what, what they need. And um, when we talk about publishing, it's very important to um, bear in mind that there are many open access journals that have um, high impact factors within their um, subject areas. Um, open access journals um, are built on the same editorial, international editorial boards that serve on uh, traditional journals. There are many um, uh, very prestigious uh, academics and clinicians acting as editors-in-chief of um, various open access journals at Biomed Central and elsewhere. And open access publishing is, is very similar to subscription publishing and the key difference is just that the content is distributed um, differently. So key aspects of um, open access um, publishing include that uh, most importantly, there's no bar barrier to, um, for readers to access content. Authors um, keep the copyrights to um, their work. And open access publishers tend to... Is that better? All right. Open access publishers tend to put more emphasis on the service they provide to authors rather than um, librarians or readers. And... It's important to bear in mind that open access publishing in itself is not a business model. It is a way of, it just means that content is distributed differently, but a lot of publishers have used various business models to make this work for them, because of course um, publishing um, in open access journals and online is still with significant um, costs um, associated for the publisher that includes um, editorial costs, the administrative um, work that goes into the peer review process, the um, production costs um, around laying out um, articles in PDFs and um, online formats, marketing departments that um, support the journals and so on. And um, many publishers do cover these um, uh, costs through an article processing charge. So um, the landscape of open access publishing has been changing dramatically over the last um, 10 years or so. When Biomed Central first started in 2000, uh, we were the only um, publisher that published open access journals and then a couple of years later uh, PLOS followed and since then um, uh, the idea of open access publishing has been embraced by lots of other journals and publishers. Every time I give this talk, I have to add more journals and publishers to this, and this is by no means a complete um, selection here, just to give you a flavor. And this graph just indicates how open access is uh, growing relative to sub uh, subscription journals. There are now more than, I think, 700 and 7,700 open access journals in the directory of open access journal, um, in the directory of open access journals. Thomson Reuters um, tracks um, more than 1,200 open access journals for, um, uh, for their impact factor calculations. Many um, funders nowadays have open access mandates, the Wellcome Trust in the UK and um, the NIH, for example, were real um, key in this development. There are also lots of um, universities nowadays who require open access. Um, some universities like Harvard, for example, um, uh, work on putting mechanisms in place to make it possible for their researchers to pay for article processing charges when they publish 
in um, open access journal search. So there's a lot of um, development in, in this area. And this list is just an example of some of the top 10 cited open access journals. Um, this is from a couple of years ago. It may have changed a bit since. You'll see that PLOS features very heavily in here. Um, one of our BMC series journals is listed. Uh, but it's a whole range of different journals that are in the top cited um, art, uh, uh, list of um, open access journals. So about Biomed Central, um, specifically, as I said, we, we started more than 10 years ago and we're still one of the largest um, publishers of um, peer-reviewed open access journals. We now have more than 230 journals across the whole range of um, biology and uh, medicine. We've published more than, I think now, 125,000 peer-reviewed um, open access articles in those um, journals over the last 10 years or so. All articles are published um, under a Creative Commons attributions license, which essentially means that the author retains the copyright but allows others free reuse of, um, of uh, the content and, and data as long as um, credit is given appropriately. Um, Biomed Central does have a business model whereby we cover um, our costs uh, through an article processing charge that is levied. Um, when the article is um, ready to be accepted. And since 2008, we're part of um, Springer, and we work very closely with um, uh, Springer Open, which is Springer's open access um, journal program that um, uh, essentially publishes in all other STM areas that are not covered by Biomed Central. Um, so... To give you some ideas about Biomed Central's flavors, I just want to um, start first by telling you about what's very similar with um, traditional journals. So it's very important to bear in mind that um, we have very standard um, peer review processes. So when uh, Biomed Central was first started, we had a number of um, editors involved who had previously been at um, Nature, the British uh, uh, Medical Journal, the Trends Journals, and they set up the editorial processes just as they were in place in a subscription journals. So Fiona Godley, for example, who is now um, the editor-in-chief of uh, British Medical Journal, was the first editorial director for medicine um, at Biomed Central. All our articles are peer-reviewed by two or three independent um, experts. We get statistical referees where we need them. Um, like with all other, with, with traditional journals, um, the um, acceptance rate in our journals varies. Um, most of them will have an acceptance rate between 45 and 55 percent. We have some highly selective journals that will publish only the top, the best 10 percent of um, our, uh, manuscripts that they receive. Our editorial models are very similar to what you would find in subscription journals. So we've got some journals with professional in-house editors. The vast majority of our journals um, has um, uh, academics and clinicians as editors-in-chief, um, many of whom are also involved with, with other journals. We've got a number of society journals, and um, our, in, our editorial boards are... Um, usually international and uh, draw from the research community in the same way as um, uh, traditional journals would. Um, uh, similarly, our editorial policies are very um, similar. We're quite active members of COPE, which is based um, in the UK, so we attend their um, uh, meetings in London regularly. Uh, we are um, members of um, WAMI. We've been very uh, proactive at um, uh, uh, setting up reporting guidelines and in particular um, data release policies is something that we've been working on um, <coughs> with other publishers to develop. So to give you a flavor of some of the journals we've got, I'll start with um, two of our flagship journals, BMC Biology and BMC Medicine. These are highly selective um, titles within our uh, BMC series journal range. And in fact, one reason why I'm currently in um, Washington, I and uh, several of my colleagues are here from London because we're, these two journals are running a scientific conference um, over in, in Georgetown on metabolism, diet, and disease. 
um, which is quite exciting. It's going very well, so we're very pleased with this. Um, and these two journals have um, uh, professional editors um, uh, as uh, uh, running the, the teams. Uh, in fact, BMC Biology is... Um, the editor of BMC Biology is Miranda Robertson, who was um, with Nature for many years. She was um, the Nature uh, Biology editor for, for a long time. Um, and these journals publish um, research, but they also have quite a lot of um, front matter. Uh, genome Biology, Genome Medicine are two other um, flagship journals that are run by a professional in-house editors together. Um, uh, with some section editors in, in the case of genome medicine. They again aim to publish only the best um, broad interest um, research articles um, they can solicit and receive. Um, and in addition to the open access research content, they also have a commissioned value-added subscription content. So these are two of a handful of journals we publish as hybrid journals. So the important thing to bear in mind, again, is that the research is open access, but the um, uh, commissioned content is, is um, behind subscription barriers. We have a few other um, journals that fall into this hybrid model. Um, including three very um, established titles which were in, uh, in existence before Biomed Central started. That includes um, arthritis research therapy, um, critical care, and breast cancer research. Um, this whole group of these five journals that are listed here all have academic editors in chief. Um, Again, their non-research content is only for subscribers, and there are some leading titles within this group. Um, for example, Breast Cancer Research ranks um, highest amongst the breast cancer-specific journals in the uh, journal citation report. Then we have a very big group of journals, what we call the independent journals. These are all... Um, uh, uh, they, they all have academic, um, academics and clinicians as um, editors-in-chief. There's a growing number of society journals amongst those, and again, we've got some really um, uh, good titles in this, in this portfolio, some leading journals within their um, fields. Um, Retrovirology, for example, is, um, is a, a journal that, we've now, that will be 10 years old next year. It started off with Biomed Central in 2003, and it's now uh, it's going really strong. It's got an impact factor of over five, heading for six, which um, for virology journals are really good um, achievement. And then um, finally we've got uh, the BMC series journals. That's really what Biomed Central started off with. It was a, it is a pioneering series of more than 60 um, journals spanning um, all subject areas across um, biology and medicine. They are, um, the, the peer review of the manuscripts in those journals is primarily handled by academic section editors and associate editors. Together, these 60 journals um, function as a mega journal, and together they get about 2,000 submissions per month. And what's, what was new when we started the BMC series more than 10 years ago was this idea of um, focusing on um, all sound science all sound, scientifically sound um, papers and separating that from the question of uh, impact and interest. And I'm sure you'll get to hear lots more about this idea a bit later. So that brings me to my second part of, um, of this talk, which is about um, new peer review models. And before I start, I just want to um, emphasize again that open access publishing in itself really doesn't mean that that is a particular form of peer review. So most of our journals, or many, or most open access journals in general, I would say, have an entirely traditional um, peer review process. But as Rita said earlier, in, um, perhaps also because the open access journals are still, many of them are still quite young, and um, started afresh, and while there's so much discussion going on about the value of peer review and um, the pros and cons of it, there have been some developments in open access journals in particular that were aimed at 
experimenting, making some changes to peer review and um, developing new ideas. And um, as journals moving, are, are moving more and more to online only publications um, and the technology underlying those um, uh, developments allow us to fine tune some of the peer review processes, this has also been a driving force behind this. And of course, um, we are um, thriving to make it more transparent, more transparent process. So I'll start with open peer review, which was first, as far as I know, first started by uh, the BMJ, which is not a Biomed Central journal. This was started by them in 1999, so before Biomed Central um, was even launched. And they started um, uh, open peer review, so reviewers' names are revealed to the authors. And um, before they started this, they did a randomized controlled trial, or while they were doing it, they were doing an RCT, um, trying to work out how this would affect the quality of the peer review. And they found, interestingly, I think, that um, more reviews would de more referees would decline to participate, but those who accepted to peer review um, provided the same quality um, reports. Their recommendations were no different from um, anonymous peer reviewers, and they didn't take um, any longer than before. So the BMJ have been operating open peer review for a long time. In an attempt to bring more transparency to the peer review process, the EMBO journals, which are published by Nature Publishing Group, started a couple of years ago to include um, what they call the peer review process file with the published um, article. So all readers can see the referees' reports, the author responses, and the editorial decision letters together with the actual article. What's important here to bear in mind is that the referees um, remain anonymous to the authors and the readers, and they can opt out. But apparently, um, most referees actually opt in and are quite happy for their reports to be um, published alongside the paper. Um, the BMC series have taken this whole idea a step further. So we combine both, thing, both things in our medical BMC series journals. Um, we have open peer review, so throughout the entire peer review process, the authors will know who the, the referees are. And if the paper is published, um, uh, the pre-publication history is visible uh, to readers as well, including the peer reviewers' names. That gives full transparency, which is particularly important in medical research, of course. We would extend this to our biological titles as well, but we find the biologists are a bit more resistant to this idea, and we can discuss why that may be. But it's interesting to see that one of our journals, BMC Cancer, which is a medical um, a journal and, and has open peer review, does actually publish quite a lot of basic science and it still works with the biologists who do have to referee those papers. Um, so this is just to show you how, how this works. This is a um, paper in BMC Cancer and here on the right you can see um, where you would find the pre-publication history of this particular article. When you get to this link you see um, a summary of the various versions of the manuscript, the original and revised versions, and the reviewers' names, and when you click on those reviewers' names, you come to the reviewers' reports. Um, the B BMJ Open, which is a relatively new sister journal of the BMJ, um, also does this now. So they have open peer review, and they do publish um, the reports um, with the paper. And the BMJ did do a, an RCT again to see whether um, telling referees that their name is revealed to the author and later also to readers and their reports are published has any effect on the quality of the reports or the recommendations and um, interestingly they found it made no difference or an insignific in, insignificant difference if anything but reviewers are less keen to participate in the process. Um, so Moving away from open peer review to some other ideas that we've been um, working with. This is a, a recent summary of, um, uh, written by Miranda Robertson, who is the editor of BMC Biology, um, taking um, stock 
of um, or, or reminding readers why the journal introduced a new um, uh, 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 peer review model four years ago. Um, we call this re-review opt-out. This was mostly in response to growing concerns from authors that they had to go through so many loops um, when referees want more and more experiments that are nothing to do with the soundness of the paper but um, really constitute the next set of experiments that could be published separately. So under this model, authors can opt out of re-review. If they are invited to revise their manuscript, they're given very clear instructions of what they need to do in order to make it publishable. And when they submit the revised version, they can opt out of having it sent back to reviewers. And then the editors will make a decision there and then whether the uh, revisions are sufficient. Um, if the article is published, then it's often accompanied by a, um, by a commentary and um, the editors will commission a commentary author and will give them access to the um, reviewers' reports. So they can actually put in their commentary some of the points right if the authors fail to do this. So here's an example of... Um, that's not to say that everything gets um, published, of course, but the, author, the editors might say this is basically okay with some things not quite fixed and we'll make sure that the readers are aware of those things. Um, this is an example of um, how this might work with a commentary um, uh, relating to a, to a research paper published in BMC Biology. Um, the Journal of Cell Biology has recently taken this on as a new idea as well. They um, introduced um, well, they, have, they had an editorial entitled Minimizing re, the Re and Re Review, and they are referring back to um, the BMC <coughs> Biology um, opt out, re review, re review opt out model, and they are um, starting to implement a similar policy in their journal. Um, so, again, this is not a Biomed Central journal. I'm just trying to give you some examples of where where else these um, peer review models are um, beginning to be implemented. Um, and then I want to show you um, uh, what we think is a very interesting experiment in one of our journals called Biology Direct, which is headed up by um, several um, prominent editors-in-chief um, uh, here in the, in the States. They felt very strongly that peer review um, wasn't serving authors very well and they devised um, a new peer review model several years ago and it's proven to be very um, successful. And um, I'll try to take you through this quickly. It's, it's a bit more complicated than it is summarized here. But so the attempt is to um, make the author responsible for the peer review process. So um, this journal has a large um, editorial board um, all very well respected scientists who uh, felt strongly about um, uh, this new model as, a, as, as an experimental idea. Um, authors are, um, have to suggest several editorial board members and have to get an agreement from at least three of them to participate in the peer review um, process. And if three editors, uh, editorial board members formally agree after they have initially skim read the paper, um, the authors are essentially in charge of what they want to do after they've seen uh, the full um, comprehensive reports which are then provided um, after um, a short period of time. The authors can either pursue publication or decide to take very serious criticisms on board and go away and do um, not publish the article. Um, it is regardless of the criticisms. The important thing is that the reviewer's comments are fully published alongside um, the paper together with the author responses. Um, this is what it will like, then look, look like. For example, when you come to PubMed, um, you'll see as part of the um, abstract who the reviewers were and there is a, a note for readers um, to refer them to the complete reports. Um, in the paper. So that puts the whole story together and some of the thinking behind this is also that there is so much debate during the peer review process which is useful and does get lost if um, 
uh, if we simply reject things or if we don't uh, make these reports um, available as part of the communication. There will, of course, be some papers in there where um, three Ed board members um, agreed to participate and then at a closer look they find that there's, um, there are serious problems with the paper uh, and they do get published. Um, but then there's a lot of debate around those often and there's comments um, that can be posted and so it, it moves us a bit closer to a post-publication peer review process. It's, it's a step in that direction and we can dis discuss how useful that may be. Um, it's quite interesting to look at how views vary between um, different um, disciplines. Um, as I said, uh, uh, our medical uh, BMC series journals um, operate this open peer review um, model and that's been uh, popular and certainly not an obstacle to growth. Um, our biology journals um, are not taking this on because generally biologists are more reluctant to um, reveal their identity to authors. Um, but as I said, Biology Direct works very, very well as a, um, as a model. Um, in physics, it's um, uh, for, a long time, for a long time been um, practiced to have uh, preprints posted and discussed before um, publishing. But um, in the life sciences and chemistries, this hasn't been particularly, um, this idea hasn't been very successful. In fact, I think Nature Proceedings recently um, closed its doors. Um, I guess there wasn't very much um, uptake. Um, the, in the geosciences, uh, there's a journal that um, uh, operates a very um, successful open review by the community but it may be successful because that's in addition rather than instead of invited uh, peer review. And double-blind peer review seems to be very common in, the ec in economics and social sciences. And um, now that Biomed Central works so closely with um, Spring Open, um, we do have, we will have opportunities to explore different types of peer reviews um, uh, depending on the needs of the, and, and uh, requests from the different communities. So this is an example of um, an economics journal published by Springer Open. Uh, and as we are running their um, technology platforms, we have just built a double-blind peer review system for them to um, respond to the editor's um, requests. So um, before I uh, finish, I just wanted to touch um, on a couple of other I, things that we've been doing to help authors um, publish. I'm sure you're aware that there has been a lot of discussion about um, how reviewers' resources are being wasted through um, repeated um, uh, requests to peer review the same manuscripts again and again as they get submitted to multiple journals. Um, the, uh, the extensive requests that are often made by peer reviewers and are not necessarily to do with the scientific soundness of um, the article is, is often um, a problem for authors. And um, we, one of our most popular articles that we've ever published is this piece by um, Virginia Woolwood at uh, Stanford University who um, tried to address this problem by explaining how we can actually train, how, how uh, faculty can train their postdocs in how to peer review um, uh, articles in a fair way without being over-demanding. Um, but critical enough. So it's a, it's a good read, actually. I, I highly recommend it. So what are we doing in order to help authors um, publish? Um, as I said earlier with the BMC series, we started early on to separate interest from soundness. So whatever the model is, peer review usually aims to establish whether research is sound and the interpretations are um, appropriate and, and put correctly in the literature um, on the one side and the other question use usually is how interesting and how much of an advance it is. And this latter question um, and the importance of it um, will differ between different journals depending on how selective they wish to be and where they set the bar 
um, for their thresholds. So the BMC series have um, always aimed at publishing sound science <coughs> with less emphasis on the interest levels, and there are now a lot of uh, so-called mega journals, including uh, PLOS One, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this, that aim to do exactly this. And another way of um, addressing this and trying to reduce the burden on um, referees is um, what we've been doing at Biomed Central for a long time now, is working with our journal Cascades, because we have a number of highly selective journals, the flagship journals listed here, plus a number of um, uh, independent um, journals that are um, uh, really only want to publish the uh, biggest stories they get with the uh, largest advance um, over previous publications, but they do receive a lot of articles that are um, uh, perfectly good papers, just not taking it as far as the journal editors would like it to be. And if that is the case, they will um, offer authors a transfer uh, to a more subject-specific journal that has a lower threshold, and uh, authors can take the peer review reports along. So this ultimately reduces the burden on, on peer reviewers so they don't have to repeatedly um, referee the same manuscripts again and again. So this brings me to my um, conclusion. So overall, um, there is now a lot of discussion out there that authors do want to get, well, authors always want to get their um, papers published and shared, but um, the way the peer review system works now um, uh, is causing quite a lot of um, uh, aggro amongst authors. And um, reducing the burden on peer reviewers is becoming increasingly important. We feel, of course, that open access and the transferable um, peer review process we offer can enhance the um, published record and increase um, transparency and um, in efficiency. But there are a number of initiatives that try to address um, the current problems. I haven't <laughs> talked at all about um, eLife. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it. It's not... Um, uh, it's in the news all over. Plus one, you'll get to hear about it. We are, we've, I've just shown you how Biomed Central uh, tries to address some of these um, things with new peer review models in Biology Direct and BMC Biology. Um, ultimately, uh, it will become more and more important um, to have post-publication peer review and services that um, filter in a different way um, what is interesting and most important, things like Mendeley F1000 will, in my view, become increasingly important. So, thank you. Question. Yeah. Um, with your journals that emphasize publishing sound science and separate mm -hmm. interest. What are the rejection criteria? What, what percentage of rejected and how does it make a difference from what you see? Um, they still reject quite a, um, a lot. Um, the rejection, the acceptance rate is probably 45% or 50% depending on the, on the journal. Um, but they don't uh, <coughs> They don't put that much emphasis on, on interest level. Um, it depends on the section editors, of course, ultimately, if they do feel strongly that something doesn't add to the literature at all. We don't, we don't want to publish it either, but it doesn't have to be a huge advance to be publishable in a BMC series journal. Does that answer your question? The, yeah? Yeah. No, this was just an example of that uh, there are different ways of peer review, not not open peer review, but um, uh, in, in physics, it's, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert in, in uh, uh, physics, but uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, it is much more common for preprints to be discussed in, within the community and be um, available before they get formally published. So that this is just um, a different way of doing peer review in the first place. There was another question, yeah? Do you have any uses for this response? 
That's a very good question, actually. Um, yes, people are um, people are looking at it. Uh, what we are trying to work out now is whether it has any um, whether it makes any impact on how people then um, use the information, and that's quite difficult. We, we're still struggling with what questions to ask and how to assess it. But we do we can actually tell um, that readers do look at the uh, pre-publication history. Yes. I, do, I don't have a I don't have a number here. No, sorry. Um, no, I, I would really guess. Sorry, I don't I don't have. We, we do have the numbers, but I don't have it here in my head. So, any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, it's, uh, you mentioned in the PowerPoint that uh, the preprint thing um, hasn't really taken off in chemistry and biology. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you could, you could discuss it, and I was just wondering if there are any views on why it hasn't taken off yet. Yeah. I, I don't have a strong view. So on, on genome biology, which is one of our um, journals, we also started a preprint um, uh, deposit uh, right from the beginning, and we just felt that um, yes, there were some papers that were submitted simultaneously, and that was mostly when authors were really keen to get their paper out, perhaps because they were about to get scooped. Um, but it was just not taken up very often, and we also closed our preprint service because we just felt it was not being used, it wasn't very popular. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I have one, one comment of something that I wondered about, which is uh, sometimes I wonder if it's the culture wagging the mechanism or the, of the way we approach it as publishers sometimes, which is this is a cool mechanism, maybe we can change mm -hmm. the culture. So archives started because of high energy physicists it was a very small community. They all knew each other and they had had years and years of sharing preprints and paper. And so for them, preprint server made perfect sense because this is the way they got commentary before they ever submitted to a journal. And we tried to, I think, take that model and impose it on huge grant funded competitive uh, areas. And I just wonder whether it's just, you know, we should just give up on this and mm -hmm. let the authors drive who wants a preprint server? Also, mm -hmm. um, don't most biomedical journals have a policy where you are not allowed to preprint if you want to publish in the journal? Mm -hmm. Prior publication. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up, could Medline, I mean, something like that, I don't know, like this exists in their community, so that, you know, to do a preprint there, you, there are some famous physics and math papers that have never been published. Mm -hmm. And they're among the most famous papers, and everyone has accepted it. It may change in biology, but I mean, Medline, I mean, it has to be something that the peers will all read in that kind of format. Mm -hmm. Maybe Google, Google Scholar will change that because Google Scholar is going to some of these um, conference, for example, to make mm -hmm. these e-print sites. And if that becomes more used, maybe that will change that uh, culture. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably right that it is to do with the size of the communities as well, that it is easier to. Um, uh, if if colleagues comment on a on a preprint and everybody knows who they are and how to put their comment into what we know about them, what they what their research background is, etc. I guess it is much easier in a smaller community. That's yes. What is the cost for your what is the cost for, so um, it, it obviously varies between um, different publishers at Biomed Central. Um, uh, again, it varies between different journals depending on the, um, on the service we offer. But the range is um, between $1,800 um, and say $2,200, something like that. The ma majority of journals will fall into that bracket. Yeah, I have a question, Michaela. Um, you had uh, talked about both um, um, open peer review, uh, which is, I think, non-anonymized peer review, and um, and transparent, which is mm -hmm. publishing the decisions mm -hmm. and the reports. Well, it's, it's one way of making things one way more of doing it. Yes, mm -hmm. and and I was just wondering if you had thoughts or experience uh, in assessing um, the response to this from the authors. 
um, who we do want to make life easier for all mm -hmm. the time, the reviewers, kind of who we also want to make life easier for, as well as the readers, um, what their views on this is. Does it make a difference? Do they prefer it? Do they not care? Um, I, mean, I, I only have anecdotal um, evidence, but um, are, are you going to try to uh, measure it? Or? Um, I don't know how you, how you would measure it. I mean, we do know that authors like the idea um, of knowing who their referees are. Um, uh, of course, we do sometimes get comments back where authors are convinced that this referee does have a conflict of interest, um, and that's something we have to deal with as, as editors. Um, much like authors often think they know who an anonymous referee is, they try to um, draw those um, uh, uh, conclusions from the way the report is written. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think we have concrete numbers to to measure this, other than uh, we know that our BMC series journals that do operate this peer review um, are growing. We measure how um, our author satisfaction is. They they measure. So we we ask our authors to um, give us feedback on how um, uh, satisfied they were with the peer review pr uh, and publication process. And do, they do uh, our medical journals do actually um, rank our service um, higher than the biology journals. That may be for various reasons, but the peer review process is, um, and we could look at this in more, more detail and dissect it, but um, uh, overall the feedback is that authors do like it on the medical journals and that these journals are growing faster than our biology journals for whatever reason, but one could possibly attribute it to this as well. <coughs> Any other questions? So shall we um, move on to Rachel? Yeah? Thank you. There's plenty of time to uh, ask questions at the end, also to go back to all of the presentations, because it's possible that something someone said now uh, will have um, additional information presented by other people. So.